mentioned time management, tongue management, and thought management briefly at the end of satsang. Can you speak more to what each of these is about? Is about? This is actually Puja Swamiji's sutra for a, a happy life. Time management, tongue management, thought management. So time management is really very simple. How many of us would like to accomplish more in a day than we do? Anybody go to sleep with to-do lists that aren't quite done? Anybody else? Yeah, right? So we'd like to accomplish more. Time management is not about squeezing 31 hours out of a 24-hour day. It's not about that. It's not about some special app that's going to help you, you know, do five things simultaneously. What it really means is having a timetable. Do I value time? How many of us waste, waste time? Now, that doesn't mean that every single moment of our life has to be work. Absolutely, there should be play, there should be enjoyment. There obviously should be our spiritual recharging of our battery time. And how do I fit all of that in to a 24-hour-a-day schedule? Or if not, at least, how do I fit it all into a seven-day-a-week schedule? So, okay, I may not necessarily get to everything every day. But in a week, my work time, my play time, my take care of my body time, whether it's yoga or walking or exercise, whatever, whatever we're doing, my spiritual recharging reconnection time. My time with my family time. But unless we schedule things properly, the days tend to slip through our hands. You get to the point where you're at the end of the day and you think, oh my God, where did the day go? And a lot of it goes in, in just getting distracted. And this has always been a case of human nature, but social media, computers, has actually just made it, made it worse. Because now, you're trying to focus on something, and suddenly there's a beep, a buzz, a ring, a, you know, whatever, whatever's happening, some kind of notification, and suddenly our attention goes there. They actually did a study in which they found that having your mobile phone, even if it's on silent and face down on the desk, if it's within arm's reach, within a couple of feet away, your productivity suffers significantly. That simply having it in your presence, again, even it's on silent, even it's face down on the desk, that somehow a portion of our brain is actually still there compared to if people have to leave it at the front door. So this is getting us more and more distracted. Social media, oh, you've got a new you know, notification, so-and-so has liked your such-and-such or has commented on your such-and-such or, you know, tagged you in such-and-such. And And suddenly it's, oh, yeah, yeah, let me see. And there we are. There we go. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of tools. One really good tool, turn off all your notifications. I'm not saying don't go on social media. But go on it when you've decided you're going to go on it. Don't go on it because you got something that says somebody has done something to you. Schedule it in, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever, whatever amount of time you've decided. Schedule it. But turn off all of your notifications. Or turn them off from everyone 
who's not your child, your spouse, I mean, someone with whom there may be actually, you know, an emergency situation that you don't want to miss. Otherwise, turn off everything. My phone, I mean, even, even just regular messages. My phone doesn't beep on text messages. It doesn't beep on WhatsApp messages. You know, I pick it up periodically and see if I've got a text message. It doesn't beep. Otherwise, it's beeping all day long. And I figure if anything is really urgent, somebody's actually going to pick up the phone and call me. So there's all kinds of little, little easy tools. Make a timetable. What time are you going to get up? And then set an alarm and actually get up. My, my adopted daughter was here recently. She's in college and was showing me her, her alarm on her phone that literally went something like 7, 705, 710, 715, 720, 725. And she had five minutes that went pretty much from like 7 to 10 a.m. And I said to her, what is this? Because I had said to her, set an alarm to get up. She says, yeah, I do set an alarm. You want to see my alarms? And she said, I just turn them off one by one by one by one. Yeah, right? So we, we know her. So obviously this isn't a very effective way of getting up in the morning. Set one alarm. Don't play the snoozing game. This is a game we all, we all play. You think, okay, I've really got to be up by 6.30. I'll set my alarm for 6.15 so that I have that sense of snoozing it until 6.30. And it gives us this kind of sort of internal pleasure of I've gotten more sleep. But actually you've gotten 15 minutes less sleep. And you've trained your brain. You've created a sanskara. We were talking last night about sanskara's grooves in our psyche that says, I don't do anything on time. I hit the snooze button every day. And that's a sanskara that goes in. Now, you've played a game with your alarm clock. But that actually stays with you in the rest of your life. Instead of that, set the alarm for 6.30 instead of 6.15, and then get up. Whatever time you've actually got to get up, set one alarm for that time. Put it across the room if you need to. And then get up. Otherwise, what ends up happening is actually really detrimental to our brain. It's not about 10 minutes of sleep or even two hours of sleep. It's about what starts to happen in our brains. There's a term in psychology called cognitive dissonance. And what that means is that my, my thoughts and my actions need to be in concert. They need to align. Otherwise, it creates dissonance. It creates discomfort within me. So for example, if I smoke cigarettes, but I know that smoking cigarettes is wrong, that's going to create discomfort in me. And so we do whatever we need to do to alleviate that discomfort. So first, I'm going to start to try to quit smoking. I'm going to try, I'm going to try, maybe I can't quit smoking. Slowly, something very interesting happens. Slowly, I start to say things like, well, anyway, it's not so bad for you. That's just propaganda of the, you know, health department because they don't want to see these good companies prosper. And, you know, my friend's grandmother lived to be 95 and she smoked three packs a day, right? She smoked into her coffin. You know, we hear all kinds of stories because our brain, our thoughts now, if I can't change my actions to match my thoughts, I'm going to change my thoughts to match my actions. So I think cheating is really wrong. I'm having an affair on my spouse. I feel horrible about it. I'm overcome with guilt. I decide, forget it. Never going to see that other person again. 
But then again, I find myself in bed with that other person. Again, I feel horrible. I say, no, no, I've got, I've got to stop cheating, got to stop cheating. But if I find myself over and over again, back in the arms of the person I'm having an affair with, eventually what's going to happen is my brain is going to start to say, well, you know, I mean, my husband isn't nice to me anyway. And, you know, actually, I'm a much nicer person now that I'm having this affair. See, I used to yell at him all the time because I was so frustrated and annoyed. Now, I'm actually much nicer to him. So, actually, it's kind of helping our marriage. I mean, you see, you see the games our mind plays. And they play it because of this thing called cognitive dissonance, that it's really important for my mind and my thoughts to be in alignment. And I mention this when we talk about time management because, or with anything important to you in your life, if you decide, I'm going to get up earlier in the morning, I'm going to be sincere in my seva, I'm going to meditate, I'm going to stop eating meat, I'm going to stop taking drugs, I'm gonna, whatever, whatever your thing is, and you don't do it, your entire mental process is going to change. And then you're going to go from being someone who thinks it's important to get up in the morning, who thinks it's important to meditate, who thinks it's important to be sincere in their seva, who thinks it's wrong to have affairs and do drugs and cheat. You're going to go from being that person into someone who thinks it's okay. Because of needing our actions and our thoughts to line up. So this is where it's so important. If you decide you're going to get up in the morning, and don't, so this is why we don't set unrealistic goals for ourselves. If you're used to getting up at 8, don't decide you're going to get up at 5 from tomorrow morning. You're just, you're setting yourself up for failure. And if you're committed to doing that, then at least go away for a 10-day meditation retreat where you're required to get up at 5 o'clock every day, where they actually come around with bells and wake you. Set something reasonable and then follow it. Because not only will you find that you're more effective and at the end of the day you've actually accomplished a lot more, but you will find that your mind is much more your friend. As your actions line up with your thoughts, that discord settles. And there becomes an incredible amount of peace in the body. Not just from actually the new actions I'm doing. It's not just getting up in the morning that brings me the peace. It's that now I'm someone who does what I think is important. Instead of being someone who's lazy, someone who can't do it, I'm now someone who does do it. So that's where it's really important. Then tongue management. So what we speak and what we eat. Both. Doesn't require that much elaboration. It's pretty self-explanatory. Think before you speak. You cannot take words back, unfortunately. Google has now come up with this great feature, right? For 30 seconds or something after you send an email, you can actually unsend it. Brand new feature, great feature. Right, I mean, you send something, you realize, oh, I was supposed to attach that, I forgot to attach it. Or as it's going, you realize there's a typo. Undo, fix it. Or you realize that you've CC'd it to people that you didn't actually intend to CC it to, undo. Whatever it may be. But unfortunately, life isn't like that. You cannot undo what you've said. And so be really careful. 
What we speak, it's an energy into the world. Do you really want to put that energy out? And then, of course, what we eat. Are we eating in alignment with our values of peace? Are we eating meals that are the result of violence? Animals who have been killed. Animals whose breeding has caused climate change and environmental destruction. I mean, the, the meat industry, animal agriculture, which is the growing of cows and pigs and chickens for consumption, is the single greatest contributor to climate change. Single greatest contributor to deforestation of our rainforests. So even if on some level you are okay with violence to a chicken or a cow, are you okay with violence to the planet? Are you okay with violence to the future? Are you okay with violence to the starving children around the world? You know, a billion people, more than a billion people, sleep hungry every night. And the amount of grain that goes into the production of one pound of beef is 16 times the amount that goes into the production of a pound of pasta or rice or bread. So every time you eat meat, you're literally saying, I deserve the food for 15 other people. Let them die because I want to eat meat. Because all of that grain gets cycled through, right? I mean, the grain is fed to the animals. That's how it works. Cows, chickens, pigs, we don't kill them on the first day of their life. We fatten them up for several years. And the vast majority of what they eat actually gets digested and pooped out. So you don't end up with a grain of meat, I mean a pound of meat, to a pound of grain that goes in. For every pound of meat that comes out, you've got to put in approximately 16 pounds of grain. But if you were making bread, or you were making rice, or you were making pasta, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Pound of grain, pound of bread. Pound of grain, pound of rice. Pound of brain, grain, pound of pasta. So are we okay with that violence? So tongue management. And then lastly, thought management. Thoughts, we were talking last night, thoughts are things. They actually go out into the, into the world. There is an energy to your thoughts. They don't exist just in your skull. And they, they create. They create our actions. My hand does not just automatically rise up and slap someone. First, there's a thought. Who the hell do you think you are? How dare you? Bam! Without the thought of who the hell do you think you are, how dare you, I'm gonna slap you. There's no slap. There's a thought that leads to that. There's a thought that leads to, I'm gonna harm you. There's a thought that leads to, as we began, it's okay to cheat. It's okay to lie. It's okay to smoke. It's okay to do this. As my thoughts change, so do my actions change. There's no, there's no God, there's no afterlife. It's all about, you know, he who dies with the most toys wins. Therefore, I'm going to just focus my life on making money. Well, that's a thought. It's a thought. It's led to now my actions, my career choices, and my entire destiny. Everything begins with a thought. The Holocaust began with a thought, an idea. 9-11 began a thought, an idea. 
India's independence began with Gandhi, a thought. So what kind of thoughts are we going to have? Because that's what's going to create our entire lives. So if we can manage those three things, we're on a really good pathway to a really good life. Not just for ourselves, but that which we bring, bring to the world.